since much of our conversation is dealing with ritual and especially rituals that deal with ancestors, uh, both in the Native American and the Irish lineage, uh, that I would start with honoring our ancestors in a ritual. Um, and I'm going to be combining a little bit of the Native American and some of the, um, the Celtic by way of my Anglican tradition as well. Um, so you might see this smoke wafting all around me. I, you know, I don't have uh, any paraphernalia here. <laughs> this is the traditional way to start a, uh, a sacred time in Native American culture, at least with my tribe, um, with the Chippewa Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Native Americans. Um, you'll see that I have in this shell a some smoke going and what I've placed in there is a uh, the, the very first thing that you would place in any sort of ritual fire, which is um, wild tobacco. So this is different than what you might think of as tobacco. Um, this is much more of a uh, like almost a tree like uh, brush and it is considered the most sacred of the four sacred medicines. Uh, in fact, what they what the uh, the native people say about tobacco is that it by especially lighting it you are sending the prayers up to god and tobacco willingly gave itself up to be the um the go between between us and our ancestors so i have some tobacco going here as well as a little <laughs> um, and i'm also going to add just a little bit of um incense celtic incense um, this is a blend that I bought in Ireland and used off the coast of Wales when I was studying there for um, for a few weeks, restarting a, an, an ancient monastery out there, St. Catfin's Monastery on Bardsey Island. So it's a very special blend of kind of both of the lineages together, since incense would be used in um, many of the monastic orders, at least uh, in the Celtic sage of their um, religious celebrations. And the other thing I'll just mention is one of the ways to start any sort of ritual is by honoring the ancestors in our lives. So I would invite you to call to mind somebody you'd like to honor as we begin tonight. Some, some ancestor of yours um, that, that could make a, that has made a difference in your life. Somebody you'd like to think about tonight and, and honoring. So if you'll hold them in your mind's eye and in your heart, just kind of let this, let this smoke waft over you as well, this, uh, this, this beautiful ritual. And if you could imagine smelling it, uh, it has, has the earthiness of the tobacco, it has the richness of the resin from the incense and really just kind of think of it wafting over you and blessing. Traditionally, you would take the smoke and you would waft it over yourself uh, as a way to bless yourself. So I'll begin by wafting it over you all in a blessing. Thank you, beautiful. You can, you can imagine taking it over yourself. And we'll begin with a prayer from All Hallows Eve. And we'll talk about the, uh, the importance of that as we go on. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have made all things in your wisdom and established the boundaries of life and death. Grant that we may hear your voice in this world and in the world to come may enjoy the rest and peace which you have appointed for your people and which our ancestors now enjoy. You, O oh Lord, have made us from the dust of the earth and to the dust our body shall return. Yet you have also breathed your spirit upon us and call us into new life. Have mercy upon us now and at the hour of our death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So we'll, we'll keep this little fire lit and burning um, for our whole conversation tonight to make it part of our own little, little ritual as we, as we really explore the equinox and the way we are able to bring these cultures together. So that's our little ritual beginning. Connor, would you like to kick it off with a question? Sure, thank you, uh, Hillary, for that, it's beautiful. And um, I figured we'd start by just giving uh, everybody a little more background into who we are and how our backgrounds influence our studies and our topics. So uh, we already talked about um, your dual heritage and I was wondering if you could go a little more into that to let 
everyone sort of understand how it shapes your worldview and how it shapes your studies. Yeah, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Um, so first and foremost, uh, my father side is almost 100% Irish. <laughs> and when you meet him, you know, and uh, he's, he's, you know, we always joke that he's like, you know, 99.9% .9 leprechaun is the joke in our family. <laughs> Uh, and I've been delighted by that and have been able to take um, a, a few study tours there where I've gone uh, in this last particular one, I've gone on my own to visit different places of both my family's spiritual lineage, um, as well as just major touch places in Irish and Scottish uh, uh, spirituality. Um, and so for me, as, as I grow in that wisdom, uh, I find more and more that it influences my prayers, it influences uh, my understanding of who I am as a person. Um, it even influences my fashion choices because I, I love a good Irish Celtic knot on something, right? <laughs> 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 but uh, the, the true growth uh, in recent years has been with my Native American heritage. As I, I mentioned at the top, I'm a Native American and I'm a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewas. And that's on my mother's side of the family. Uh, my grandfather was born on the reservation and, uh, and was like many people of that generation, um, unable to really embrace all that that meant because in this country, um, there was a, a very uh, active trying to, to, to erase all of what it meant to be Native American. And so what many people are doing now is they're finding through their blood memory what those things have been lost and trying to reincorporate them. Um, so this last summer I was able to go up to my tribe, or two summers ago, go up to my reservation and study with our tribe's uh, medicine man and really learn some of the spirituality pieces. Um, and he, he gave me my Native American name after uh, much prayer and offering of tobacco. Uh, and it's Painted Turtle, which I think is, is quite lovely and, and really pulls on many of the myths of, uh, of several Native American tribes who consider North America um, turtle Island, uh, because of a myth that says on the back of the turtle, a little piece of, of mud was, was the thing that brought forth all of this land. So, um, so yeah, I, it is a, a burgeoning, uh, part of my own spirituality and identity, um, that I'm, I'm so happy to be able to reclaim. Yeah. And that's, um, a fantastic point. Uh, the, the, the diaspora center being based in the Pennsylvania area, I'm sure many of our um, attendees know about the history of the Carlisle School and the uh, cultural battle and erasure of culture that went on there. And one of the things that is, is interesting uh, in both Irish culture, like the Celtic has been that because our cultures historically have been oral cultures and orally passed down, uh, we it's much more difficult to uh, form an educational system that removes those cultures completely, you know. And so I was wondering then about that if you who have you've studied blood memory, if you could sort of explain to the audience what blood memory means and we could have a little conversation about how it impacts culture. I'd be delighted to. Uh, and that's that's really a chief place of my own study. So I could talk about this all night. So you're going to have to rein me in. <laughs> um, blood memory, it it is a term used in indigenous culture to talk about the stuff we inherit that goes well beyond just our DNA, right? You know, it's, it's the things that um, are passed down that might we might consider character traits or uh, tendencies for emotion. And it's in, especially in the indigenous culture, people believe that that's seven generations. So that something that you do in your life will affect seven generations beyond you. And that seven generations before you have, have helped to create who you are. What's really fascinating is science is beginning to catch up to our indigenous brothers and sisters in this. Um, and in fact, many studies are now showing exactly this feature, that it's not just the color of our hair or our eyes, 
uh, that are able to, you know, help us become who we are. Uh, they've studied it most with trauma and PTSD and depression. Uh, I guess, sadly, those are some of the easier things to track. And what they find is, let's say um, your grandmother had a very traumatic experience happen to her. And it, it can actually change the way um, a DNA will work, like the mephlatotation and, and the way a DNA can actually pa be passed down will be changed by that trauma. And what they're finding is, up to three generations at least of her offspring will be more likely to have depression, PTSD, and trauma responses uh, than, than another member of her family that didn't have that traumatic response. And that goes even beyond just a ge genetic predisposition, right? Because that's situational depression and trauma. Uh, and so my theory uh, has been, and I've been, I've been uh, uh, testing this out and, and have a journal article coming out on this that it's not just those negative things that can make an impression upon us but those those very deep spiritual things that happen within our lives and that we're that we're taught those get passed down as well in particular i've been looking at gratitude in blood memory because uh, again science has been showing what religions have known for years that gratitude can actually change a person and not just kind of their attitude in life, which it does, but it, it actually changes a person physically. People have, uh, they sleep better, they have better heart rates. Um, they actually find that hormonally they are different. They're actually uh, more predisposed to have um, those oxytoxins and, and those, those good sorts of hormones, right? You know, the kind that uh, link people together. And and so I think what we're going to find is science is going to catch up with that as well and say that it's not just the traumatic stuff in life. It's, it's all of it that gets passed down. Yeah. Um, the, I think that it's such a fascinating idea to look at the positive side. I think there, there's been a lot of studies in the epigenetic field on trauma. As you said, I know that in Ireland now there's a lot of studies on sort of the history of colonization and its impact on say for like example in my hometown of Belfast why it has one of the highest suicide rates in the world um and a lot of that is to do with you know colonial trauma a lot of it's to do with the troubles that we went through you know for the last 40 years uh the Native American communities interestingly have very similar experiences in terms of problems with alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide that have been, that many Irish people now have that we're now figuring out has become part of the study of epigenetics. But people really don't mention the positive, although if you um, talk to community members, you often hear people joke about how Irish people and Native American people like I've never met anyone who had the same sense of humor as a Native American until I went to Ireland type stories I hear some of my friends in Montana say stuff like that you know and so positive traits are are definitely something that I think can be passed down uh cultural traits too but we you know science hasn't really wanted to look at that so much even though those are the aspects that maybe community members have already figured out, right? And people from indigenous nations have realized when they see, you know, when Irish people look at the Navajo and they've donated money or when the Choctaw or the Cherokee have done the same, uh, they see the negative, but they also see similarities in the positive as well. So it's great with your work on gratitude, especially, you know, teaching people about the, these positive um, blood memory, uh, epigenetic, epigenetic DNA stuff. Yeah, you know? I see somebody in the chat has rightly also uh, highlighted like resiliency as a big piece of this as well. Like for sure, I mean that's that's uh, a great a great read on this is the the book Grit, uh, and and it talks about this kind of quality of resiliency and so many indigenous cultures. Um, have had to form resiliency 
due to the colonization, due, due to the trying to have been wiped off the face of the earth, right? You know, it, and you, you learn a lot about how it, to stay resilient in the face of all that trauma. Yeah, and I think that the, the link between humor and resilience is important as well. People will always say to me, how come so many Irish plays are, are so dark? And I was like, well, you know, colonization can do that to you. Uh, people joke around a lot more. And, you know, I think that the idea of blood memory is utilized in indigenous communities and in Irish, like, traditional Gaelic communities as well. Um, I'm thinking from the historical perspective of the 1916 Rising, Padraig Pierce, who was one of the leaders of the Rising, had this idea of the cyclical nature of revolution in which he believed that all Irish people were inherently like via their DNA essentially uh, going to rebel against colonial rule until colonial rule ended and so he would say oh if you look at Wolf Tone and then right after Wolf Tone you have Robert Emmett etc etc like it's just we're the next in the cycle and it will keep going so there are many different ways in which people look at the idea of um, blood memory. And I think blood memory is such a great name uh, too. I, I think when I use it, people almost instantly know what it means. You know, they're like, I didn't know there was a term for that. <laughs> you know? But there it is, there it is. It's, it's uh, really a per the perfect term for it. Yeah. I, I first learned it in a kind of funny way. I. I when I started my research, I called up my tribe and you mentioned this earlier, it's very difficult to do indigenous research because um, it's an oral history, right? And that's that's true of, of both the, the Irish and the Native American. Um, and so to find good scholarly work that hasn't been reinterpreted through the lens of, you know, white colonialism is very difficult. Uh, and so, um, you know, as I was told, I just had to go to my tribe and <laughs> and go there and be told things. Uh, and and that's where I first learned even the term blood memory, because it wasn't showing up in the research. Uh, and and yet there it was as soon as it, as soon as I had this first conversation, this is where I learned about it. Yeah, and it's a great point you make as well, which is the sort of separation between the academic and the communal understanding of history. The, I, when I first started my research, I would go to reservations a lot and meet with elders and people would say to me, oh, well, what evidence have you got for this? And I was like, well, this guy sent me an email with all the stuff he knew about history. And they would say, well, how do you know it's right? And I was like, well, how do you know a newspaper from 200 years ago is right? You know, it, to me, we have to understand that the oral tradition is valuable in itself and that you like if you're relying on government documents or a newspaper or any sort of written steady state uh traditional history you're also going to have issues so it's important for academics i think to move into a setting where they're engaging actively with alternative modes of communication and history and it's it's why uh the reclaiming of language is so important i mean we see this both in our irish culture where we're trying to to really establish gaelic and you know people learning it again you know and having it as as common uh tongue but also you really really see this in the native american culture um trying to reclaim tribal language which is almost all but evaporated in some tribes because it's been you know the the youth were taken away and sent to these boarding schools um torture schools really and they were not allowed to speak their language and so it's almost all but disappeared uh, and, and I'll give you a great example of why storytelling in its original language is so important as, as it relates to blood memory and gratitude. There's a word in uh, my, my, my tribe's language called miigwech. And miigwech is a word that really means thank you, but more of a thank you from the deepest part of my soul for this transaction that makes us one, right? You know, not just your basic, thanks very much, right? You know, and, 
And that word didn't even actually exist until uh, Native Americans had to start talking to the, the, like the French fur trappers who were coming to that area. Um, they didn't have a word for thank you because it was already understood that, that, that you are so knit together as a, as a web of life that when somebody had a need, you would give and vice versa. So you wouldn't even have to say thank you because it was just assumed that that was the, that was the culture. Um, instead of, there's that great expression that instead of having rights, as we see in Western culture, Native Americans see them, themselves as having obligations, right? And, and that really comes through in that one word that you unpack it and suddenly there's an entire rich culture there um, that is just underneath the surface. And you wouldn't know without the original language. Yeah, and you know, this is one of the things that we we have a lot of uh, Americans, a lot of British people in in Ireland historically who have written about these cultures. And you know, I read through primary sources all of the time for my dissertation, and you see, well, the difference between the savage and the civilized is that one is an individual and the other is communal, you know, and those types of quotes, like they fundamentally misunderstand the social organization of the people that they're interacting with. And that's why I think it's, it's important to go and discuss with community elders and historians in different nations to find out what people were saying and try and revitalize the language. I remember the first time I met with a lady, she was a fascinating figure, a uh, Lakota woman who was a Jehovah's Witness, and she was trying to get me to, uh, you know, convert to being a Jehovah's Witness. So I was chatting with her because the pamphlets were in English and in Lakota. And so I was, you know, trying to look at the pamphlets as primary sources. And she was telling me how sad she was that none of her grandchildren would be able to read her Bible because it wasn't in English and they didn't know their language and that she was, you know, incredibly upset that she wasn't going to be able to pass it on in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that this is a struggle that Irish people and Native Americans across the board can understand, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so outside of this, I, I did want to focus more on the uh, the equinox and uh, Samhain and sort of try to have a conversation about what it, like the importance of the fall equinox uh, in indigenous Celtic and Native American cultures. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the fall equinox, Samhain and, and the, their importance? Yeah, I'd be delighted. Um, so let's start with Samhain because that's probably the one that we're most uh, familiar with, the, the Irish one. Um, and this is really the turning of the season, one that has stuck with us and been, re I'll say, reappropriated by modern Christianity. <laughs> Shall I put it that way? Does that sound nicer than yeah. <laughs> stolen? <laughs> And I, I think there's uh, some real beauty in this uh, this particular. It's one of the it's one of the the equinox days within the Celtic calendar. Um, but let's start listening to some of the similarities between theirs and the Native American what's known as the Ghost Feast. Um, already, kind of you know, with Samhain, we we think of the way that our ancestors are um, able to come to us that day, uh, and uh, like the the beauty of the this particular feast is that the Celts believe that that veil that separates heaven and earth is very thin on this day. And so you are able to, to contact ancestors in a way that you wouldn't normally be, be able to. Um, and so you have a lot of rituals associated with it. Uh, you have bonfires, uh, you know, large fires to, to both act as cleansing agents, but also as a, maybe attracting spirits or repelling spirits, depending on what era of Samhain you are, you're celebrating. Um, and you also see a lot of mummers, right? You know, people in costumes, uh, really uh, celebrating in a big way that uh, if the veil is thin, you want to be cautious that, you know, it's one thing to see your ancestors, it's, it's another to see 
something perhaps a little less desirable, right? So the the mumming costumes help take on uh, both a way of, of of celebration, but also protection. Um, and what's very cool about this the Samhain tradition is how it has been. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of good good words in the chat. Reabsorbed, uh, stolen. <laughs> uh, you know the way it's the way it's now celebrated in Christianity. I'll put it that way. The way we celebrate it, and and to me, this is um, this is one of the most important feast day of the church year as a priest that I love celebrating. It's that it's that crossover between Halloween, which is really the Samhain's uh, kind of lineage into uh, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Um, so Halloween, of course, is the uh, October 21st, I'm sorry, 31st, um, which is that time of Samhain. Uh, and then, you know, that is that All Hallows Eve, now Halloween, uh, that we now herald as the Eve, a feast day Eve of All, Soul, All Saints Day. And All Saints Day in the church calendar is when, of course, we think of our ancestors of the faith. We celebrate them. We sing huge hymns and uh, talk about the saints that have gone on before. And then the next day is All Souls Day, the day where we remember those faithful departed in our own lives, doing things like we did at the beginning of this presentation, recalling our ancestors um, and remembering those who perhaps are only known to God. So it's a very, it is that very thin, thin, holy place. Um, but then you'll notice some real similarities in the way uh, the, the Native Americans celebrate their thin place. Same sort of date, right? You know, around that 31st date, um, at least in my tribe, we have the ghost feast. And the ghost feast is at the annual time of honoring the ancestors and loved ones that are are closer. They maybe don't use the same uh, phrase as thin place, but they're st somehow more accessible on this date. Um, and this is when you'll have different communal celebrations. Again, think bonfire, think, uh, think the regalia, uh, the, the beautiful cost, I mean, the beautiful sacred wearing of, of the feathers and of the dresses. Um, and most importantly, you would have a feast with your ancestors. So you would you would perhaps not only bring forth the food of the of the the festival that year the the, the harvest the berries and the fish in particular if you're talking my tribe in northern uh, Michigan, but you'd also perhaps prepare the favorite food of a loved one that had gone on before. You would take that special plate to their resting place, and you still see these in uh, in their cemeteries today i visited a few uh, on my trips that have these these uh these ghost huts and they're a hut uh like it looks like a little house built over the grave um and you would just kind of open up the door and you would place the plate in so that your ancestors could be a part of the feast so you really see some deep similarities in these celebrations um, and the honoring of the ancestors being really paramount uh, in these these very thin thin times of year. Yeah, and one of the things that strikes me as interesting about the equinox and also about the relationship between Celtic culture and indigenous cultures in general is sort of understanding of time, right? I when I tell people Irish people understand you like they understood time differently. People say to me, "Well, how?" Can understand time differently you know and I was like well they didn't really work around a clock you know they weren't thinking in terms of that and the calendar was different and so the equinox especially with like the Navajo and uh Samhain with with the Irish and the Scottish too but uh tends to be the time in which we begin to understand the end of the lighter half of the year and the beginning of the darker half of the year. And that's really how the year is seen, especially with the Irish, it's sort of broken up into four major um, festivals, but the lighter half of the year and the darker half of the year are, are the most important. And it is interesting um, that both, both indigenous nations and the Irish have highlighted their calendar in this sort of split, you know, and 
they and that goes on to daily work you know one of the things that the americans face and the british face when they came in to ireland or to north america was their inability to understand how time worked with uh within the daily lives of people where the they were trying to bring in especially industrialization in the 19th century and the 20th century these concepts of time based around the watch based around work from nine to five and irish people and native americans didn't traditionally ever work from nine to five or if you were making an appointment it might be like we're going to meet you in a couple of days and Irish people tend to show up late because the idea is just to meet people at the time is not necessarily to meet someone at 4 p.m. sharp, right? <laughs> you know? Wow, like it's it's very, like I, I was told when I went to my tribe, don't bother like making set appointments. Like, you, like you're gonna have general appointments and you'll probably kind of like get the beginning of the day or the end of the day. And it was just like that. And it works, you know, you really have the rhythm of it. I, I think the other thing you're really highlighting is the season of the year we're entering, it, it makes sense to be thinking about the dead, right? Because we're entering the, the death part of the year. Um, the, the sun is dying. If you're an ancient pe people, you know, you're, you're hoping the sun will return again uh, as the year creeps on, but you're, you're coming to the dead of night part of the season. Um, the the trees they're starting to die right you know to the to the eye uh, we're we're watching everything happen so it doesn't surprise me that cross culturally we see this real emphasis on the dead at this time because hopefully the ancestors will guide us through this valley of death into the time of the returning sun yeah and it it's such a uh uh an important concept i saw jack had wrote about how everywhere had had a sort of similar concept of time i would say as a historian i don't believe in using the term everywhere places are contingently different um but yeah i've read ep thompson and and uh understand time discipline and i agree that Obviously, with capitalism, there is a shift, but we have to understand that even within shifts, there are fundamental differences between native cultures and, you know, Anglo cultures and people who are coming in. So I think, you know, it is important to recognize that even pre-capitalism or pre-modernity or whatever you want to call it, we still have differences in cultures uh, everywhere. And so, I think that most of the uh, the uh, interesting stories for most people, the everyday stories, could be um, really about the overlap on folklore for the Irish and and Native Americans and myths as well. Uh, there's a lot of fun, you know, Irish stories. People will tell you a lot. My mom, when I was younger, used to always talk to me about. Uh, I told you about this before, she was afraid of the banshee. And so I wasn't allowed to look outside at nighttime in case the banshee would take me. And so <laughs> that was like a thing that came in a lot with my, like, with my life. Um, but there's a lot of fun overlaps between concepts like the leprechaun and, you know, the different Native American understandings of quote unquote little people. Yeah, we have uh, in my tribe, it's the Mimigwezi. And the Mimigwezi um, are actually this time of year around the equinox, you're supposed to leave much like on the fairy hills, uh, you know, and the, the, the mounds, the fairy mounds, you're supposed to leave little gifts for them at this point um, of the year so that they will uh, help you during the winter time. And it can be like, you know, a little bit of uh, bronze or it can be, you know, a nice bit of spell, like that. Um, but it's again, very similar that there's this idea that, you know, don't mess with them <laughs> just like the leprechauns and the fairy you don't mess like don't go up on that mound and try to you know destroy it or anything but if you respect them they'll hopefully respect you but there's that kind of like trickster quality to them as well another thing i really love about native american storytelling at this time of year that i just find utterly charming 
um, is that this is the time of year where you're allowed to start telling the ancient stories about the animals again, at least my tribe. Um, because many of the animals will start to go into hibernation around this time. And it was considered rude to talk about them when they might be able to overhear you in the other parts of the year where uh, you'd be, you know, they'd be out and about. So, you know, don't talk about the bear if the bear is going to hear you. <laughs> it just was rude to gossip like that. So uh, I just find that really fun um, that the, the way stories begin to be crafted are seasonal as well. And it's the same with us today. I mean, in our religious ceremonies, um, we tell certain stories in certain times of the year. Like, you know, if it's Christmas time, you're hearing about baby Jesus. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. But also we do this in our families, don't we? I mean, you know, Thanksgiving, you, you'll probably tell the story of the time, Uncle Jack, you know, drop the turkey, or, you know, you'll, you'll tell the story about the Christmas tree that went up in flames, whatever it is, you know, like you have these seasonal stories too. Um, so we can really understand that. I, I'll, I'd like to say a word about myth making um, yep. and the importance of it. I, you know, many of you will know the work of the great Joseph Campbell, of course, and the, the, the way he studied myth in society. And one of the things he really cautioned in his, his last interviews in particular was what he saw as the detriment of our modern day society, that we, we are not a people that sit around fires looking at the moon anymore and make it. Um, kind of the best he saw was maybe Star Wars, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's fine, but it's not quite the same thing as a society making their own myths. Um, and, and what we lose when we, when we don't carry on that lineage, I think is pretty major. We, we lose a sense of identity. Uh, we lose the teachings of right and wrong in, in particular with our cultures. Um, and we, we lose the sense of, of, I think, wonder that is so critical in blood memory, um, wonder and imagination and understanding the world more than just, just the scientific facts of things um, that are so, so necessary. So I just, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why remembering the equinox and how they are in these traditions is just so utterly important. It's part of our myth making. Yeah, and uh, a couple of things on that. I do, I do think that with the the leprechaun story, we we do forget that the leprechaun that we see today is really an invention of Disney and comes from Darby O'Gill and the Little People. But what's interesting with like. Uh, Cree myth or Chippewa myth is that the they are much more rascally, which is what traditionally leprechauns were like. Most of the stories are of leprechauns burying themselves in the ground and then attacking people if they steal their stuff, you know. And so it it is funny to see how almost identical these cultural uh, links are. And there's you know there's going to be overlap in uh, different cultures in general. That's just relatively a normal thing but it is fun with the leprechaun and, and on myth making I think that it is part of the important it is something that unites culture is this sort of general mythology of a culture and the passing down of myth and legend and I think that we see in a lot of our modern time is a erosion of mismaking like you said and the consequences for that are you know hurting the community even though to most people it seems sort of trivial to get rid of you know stories about the banshee or uh you know things about you know don't walk underneath a letter even though they're little stories that don't really seem to mean any much anything to you at that time they really are unifying factors that we have you know a commonality around and yeah so i think that one of the other things that you had mentioned that i wanted to go into a little bit what was um talking about relations to nature and to animals and i really love studying the sort of relationship between irish people native american people um and understandings of their relations to nature and how nature impacts society and one of those things with, with uh which is comes into that i think sort of um on jack's point as well is 
how fundamentally understanding the way in which society is structured and the way in which we view nature changes our concepts of things like sexuality and gender and those types of relations. Like for the Irish, they didn't necessarily have like a two spirit situation that we see in a lot of indigenous cultures, but the Breton law and um, traditional Celtic cultures did not, you know, penalize uh, same sex relationships and they didn't, uh, there was no, it, it wasn't um, frowned upon in the same way that we see in Anglo society and American society later. So the Irish traditionally had been very open to understandings of same sex relationships based on their concept of the natural world. And so I was just wondering if we talk a little bit about nature. Mm -hmm. An embodiment of it, right? Because I, I, I think it's, it's almost a trope to think of indigenous people uh, of any culture as being, you know, closer to nature. But I think it's only a trope because I don't, I think we lose exactly what that means, which is a tie to the land such that you don't see yourself as over or above it in any way. You see yourself as a, as a grateful and loving participant in it. And it certainly in the creation stories of the Native Americans, like they are, they're the last thing to be created humans, right? Which of course is the same with, with uh, our, our, our Christian view of things. Like it's, it's that idea that humans are here to tread lightly on the earth uh, is, is seen even in how they describe um, Mother Earth, not as just like this, um, this kind of embodiment of Gaia, but rather it's like even the sweet grass is her hair, right? You know, the, the rivers is her blood. Like they, they actually really get very specific about what they mean to live on Mother Earth. And, you know, since we're talking equinoxes, the moon is so, so important uh, for, for indigenous cultures. But in my tribe, like the moon dictates uh, the entirety really of, especially a woman's life. Like they, she, you know, as soon as um, she hits her first moon ritual, like from then on in, she is able to kind of live according to grandmother moon's timetable. So it's not like the solar 24 hour calendar, you know, it's instead uh, a, an internal rhythm of 28 days, you know, and um, you even see that on the way back to painted turtle, how they, they represent the, the, the way turtle is symbolized, right? If, if all of creation is on the back of the turtle, you'll, you'll notice in the iconography of turtles in Native American culture, they will have 13 different sections on its back, 13 different little scales. And that's for the 13 full moons of the year. You know, so even you can really see how they just, they mean it. Everything is really woven together. And so if your blood memory is to, uh, to be affecting you and seven generations from now, think about how every action we do on the planet uh, is affecting seven generations. And that was before they understood plastics that, that go well beyond seven generations, right? You know, at, I don't think we could possibly say that we tread lightly on the earth uh, in the same understanding when you when you see the care given. Um, if, you, if, we, if we shaped our spending habits to think, you know, what I'm about to purchase, how is this gonna affect seven generations now in the production? in the waste material, in it, in the way that it's going to uh, live in my house maybe for two more generations. <laughs> it's just, these are really important questions to ask. And uh, something I think many of, of those of us raised in Western culture do not have an understanding of because we're more like man versus nature instead of man lower than nature, <laughs> willingly walking gently on the earth. Yeah, I, in some of my research, this has come up a lot on organizing the economy, as you talked about, uh, with, you know, biblically, the order to subdue the land is taking as like, you know, controlling the land, where the Lakota, for example, example, have the understanding of the equality of the two legged and the four legged. Uh, and that's, you know, the terminology used by uh, spiritual leaders in Lakota society basically saying that, 
you know, I am equal to the buffalo. I am equal to, you know, the horse and we're all in relation together. And not that I'm necessarily better than, but I'm a companion with. And I think it is one of the things that you said and that we should have, you know, tread carefully on is, like you said, that saying that the relationship with nature is different doesn't mean uh, that people didn't, uh, like that people like only lived in, an, in the nature itself with the same sort of understandings, but they lived in like a park, right? This is not what it means. It means that a fundamental difference in structuring your life based on your relationship to your environment. And, you know, there, there are legal scholars of Irish law who have argued that under Breton law, it would have been impossible to build a city because it would do too much damage to a forest to build a city, you know. And so that's the type of relationship with nature that we have to think about when we do talk about that because both the Irish and Native Americans, Native Americans more in this case, have been heavily stereotyped in what their relationship with the natural world means. I love um, the laws, by the way. My fa I'm, I'm a fourth generation beekeeper, and my favorite one is uh, where they talk about the rights of the bees. And if you come into a territory and you hurt a beehive, like it's on you to make reparations yeah. to the bees. I just love that. I mean, like that's. Uh, yep, that's how it probably should be, really. I mean, we can't stop <laughs> them. And so there you go. I still see that now. Every time I'm like outside and I see someone swatting at the bee, I'm like, well, you're hurting the bee. The bee is not doing anything wrong. Leave the bee alone. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and I think one of the uh, last things that I really wanted to cover, because I want people to have, you know, opportunities to ask questions, you know, audibly um is what do you think are the biggest takeaways for someone if they were trying to understand what native american and celtic practices we could bring into the modern world what what would you want people to start taking away from that i mean obviously i'd start with an understanding of gratitude because i i think it's pivotal in all of uh, the conversations we've had tonight um, gratitude for our ancestors, gratitude for the earth, uh, because I think when you have that as a, as a concept woven into your spirituality and your life, not only will you feel better and be a better person, you'll, you'll, you'll have a, you'll have a more of a worldview that takes it all in as, as equality rather than just, you know, I need, I need to get mine. Right. You know, that's, that's one thing. Um, but I'd also say it's, it is a really beautiful thing to go back and find out what the spirituality of your ancestors would be um, and and maybe what rituals they would have practiced and why and what stories they would have told. Um, I have found that it has increased my prayer life tremendously being able to bring some of these rituals in that I that some I knew since I was a little girl, some I'm, I'm learning now as an adult, and yet they were in me and 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 it's that blood memory of when I settled down into prayer, I'm not just settling down into the prayers of myself, I'm settling into the prayers of my ancestors and the, the prayers that they had been praying for me without even knowing me yet, right? You know, for seven generations, their prayers are, are, are within me. Um, and hopefully seven generations beyond me, you know, my prayers will affect that. And I, I think there's a beauty in finding your blood memory and, and healing it too, right? You know, being able to heal in that chain of blood memory. So those are some of my, what I would hope would be a, a takeaway. Yeah, I think for me, definitely the big takeaways, especially coming up to uh, Halloween and the equinoxes is understanding the importance, as you said, of, of blood memory and of our ancestry and understanding that conceptually how we can think about that relationship with our ancestors differently. And the other thing that I think I would really be, you know, I would want people to take away from today or what they could learn is that, you know, the structures of society that we have today are structures set in place by, you know, 
historical events, but they weren't the only structures and they're not necessarily the most viable structures. So I hear this a lot in common debates. People say, well, you either have to do this or you have to do this. And I'll say to them, well, why do we have to do that or that? And they're like, cause that's all how it's always been, you know? And I'm like, you know, we can find alternatives that come from Celtic culture to come from, you know, indigenous cultures throughout America. Um, and there are many with many different ideas that, that we can, you know, implement some of the better practices that maybe we had lost from history. And, and I think what's beautiful about that is it's, they're not lost because they're internal, they're, they're part of our blood memory. It's just us reclaiming them and starting to live them. And it's, I don't know, some of the, some of the, the ways that I've been able to incorporate it feels, it feels almost hauntingly like falling off a bike, but just getting right, right back on it. Like, oh, I did not know that I was missing this but now that I have it, I can't not have it. Like, it's just, it's there. That's great. And I think, I think that um, if that's good, I, I'm happy to open it up to questions from you guys. Um, and last time I just sort of did a free for all. I don't know if there